Hello everyone, this is Nathan P. Butler, this is my vlog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof, and this is the first of two episodes we're going to be doing here that look at Solo A Star Wars Story. This episode is a spoiler-free review, so this should be perfectly safe if you haven't seen the film yet. Then we have a spoiler-filled review in the next episode, and that's going to look at detailed plot points because I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of take notes in the back on my second viewing of the film, so I can actually talk about it in some depth and look up some things I was curious about in the new Solo, the official guide book that came out on the same day as the film. Uh, I'm not going to be repeating a whole lot between the two episodes here. So this episode is focusing on general thoughts about the film in general. Uh, did it hit all the marks that were expected? Sort of a comparison to other things that we've seen recently. Uh, and a bit about, actually quite a bit, about the performances themselves uh, amongst the cast and uh, uh, the characters that they portray. Okay, so that's kind of what this episode is going to be in a nutshell in a way that doesn't spoil. And then the next episode is going to try to forego most of that to go into some things in detail that will require spoiling to really delve into those items. So if you really want the full picture of my thoughts on the film, you want to check out this episode and the next episode both uh, rather than one or the other. To give you some context here. Uh, my wife and I went to go see Solo, A Star Wars Story at the 10.05 p.m. showing in uh, Fayetteville, Georgia at the Cinemark Tinseltown 17 Theater. We watched it in XD, which if you're not familiar with that, is bigger than uh, basically what you would expect from a regular screen, but smaller than an IMAX screen. Uh, and we did watch it in Real D 3D. The 3D effect, for what it's worth, was very subdued. In the film, I must say, it really did not seem as though the 3D effect was very pronounced. Uh, I would say that it's a lot more like the 3D effect, say, in Rogue One, though, than what we got, say, with The Force Awakens. When you did have the 3D effect, it wasn't so much a diorama feeling as a traditional 3D effect, when it was noticeable at all. This actually turned out to be the second film that we basically took our unborn son to in utero, it seems. Uh, we didn't know that she was pregnant at the time that we went to go see The Last Jedi, but he was conceived a couple of weeks before that, so he's actually been to two Star Wars movies already. And the key thing here there that I want to point out is that this is an unusual thing, not just, you know, the pregnancy and all, but the fact that we got two new Star Wars movies within six months of each other. That has never happened unless you look at the special editions, and I don't consider that new Star Wars films released within six months of each other, because those, of course, were essentially re-releases with changes made to them. So it's an unusual time to be a Star Wars fan, and now we've got about a year and a half until we get episode nine. Uh, so an odd six month period here. Uh, generally speaking, I enjoyed the film, so did she. Um, it was a fun ride, it was an enjoyable ride. It was interesting because, I mean, the film was, what, two hours and 15 minutes long? I mean, it was a fairly long film for a Star Wars film, and yet, it probably is the one Star Wars film that felt like it was the shortest to me. Um, it didn't feel like it really led up a lot. Uh, as you may know, my big thing when it comes to Star Wars films a lot of times and how I'm able to rank them, and I have no idea where this would fall within the ranking. It's a very confusing film in that regard, uh, so I'm not even going to try yet. But when I think about Star Wars films, a lot of times what gets me is pacing. Like, The Empire Strikes Back is a phenomenal film, but the pacing in the middle section kills me every time. So I can't put it as my number one Star Wars film. It winds up sliding down the list because of pacing. Uh, same thing with A New Hope. The pacing of the first about half of the film gets me every time. This film, uh, like most of the more modern Star Wars films, the pacing was a lot smoother, and in this case it felt like it was just a continuous ride, so it didn't feel like it was, you know, two hours and 15 minutes or whatever it was when in the theater, which is good. Uh, it was a fun film, uh, really enjoyable. I don't really have a lot of complaints about the film, in general. Uh, this is the first time in a while, actually since 2002, that I've been able to walk out of a theater having seen a new Star Wars film and not immediately think, oh my god, this is my favorite Star Wars film. I felt that with Attack of the Clones, and I look on it now and think I was crazy, but I talked about the details of it back in the first episode of Chrono Radio, my first podcast, which premiered on the same day as Attack of the Clones. Um, felt the same way about Revenge of the Sith, and it stayed my favorite Star Wars film for a long time, but then I felt the same about The Force Awakens, and then Rogue One, though it was jockeying back and forth with The Force Awakens, and then The Last Jedi. Not this time. I do think that it's probably going to wind up fairly high on my rankings, but I think I'm going to have to change my style of rankings. 
I don't think it can really be the way that I would describe it as sort of a general ranking system of Star Wars films. It's going to have to be like ranked by story, ranked by performance, ranked by impact on the society as a whole of the galaxy and stuff like that, rather than it just being a regular ranking system. Because this was a fun film, but an extremely, extremely predictable film. There were two big surprises in the film that I didn't see coming or wouldn't have seen coming. One, there's a and they're both actually related to characters. There's one that has to do with a character appearance in relation to the film that I had spoiled at least the character being in the film uh, by talking to Michael Morris before the film. Uh, he talked about, he got to see a press screening. He's my uh, podcasting partner for Cloud City Casino. It's actually his podcast, I'm Along for the Ride. But he got to see a press screening and said there was something in the film that was going to break the internet that had to do with a character appearance. And I was kind of like, hmm, I don't want context, but who is it? And he told me, so the context surprised me, but the appearance didn't. And there was one other thing that happens in the back half of the film that also was surprising. But the rest of the film, for me, for the most part, utterly predictable. That's not necessarily a bad thing. What it means is this is a film that really follows a formula. You've seen this story a million times before. You know, the, the young, scrappy street kid who wants to become part of a, a criminal gang of some kind because he needs a family or whatever. Um or has his own motives, and the wise mentor that takes him in, but is a shady guy in and of himself. Uh, it's a train heist film. It's a what happens when a heist uh, doesn't go exactly according to plan, and you have uh, higher-ups above you in the criminal organization that you must make it up to when your life is on the line because they won't let you screw up anymore. Um, there's just a lot about this film that is, wow, we've seen that a million times before. Maybe not in this context, maybe not in this combination, and maybe not for Star Wars, but... It is very predictable because of how formulaic it is. I have said before when talking about The Last Jedi that I think part of why those who hated The Last Jedi or those who reacted negatively to it, a piece of why that was the case, was because Star Wars, generally speaking, has been comfort food in the past. It's been a relatively predictable uh, film process or story process for each film, partly because they're based on archetypes or partly because they're based on things like the hero's journey or the tragic uh, uh, framework that you might see, but that basically there's usually not a lot of surprises in Star Wars films, whereas The Last Jedi was a film that was very risky and had a lot of surprises uh, that was very different than that comfort food feel that would cause people to say, wait a second, this is not what I expect from Star Wars. I sat down expecting chocolate cake and you just gave me jalapenos. Not the same thing. I think that, in essence, Solo is the exact opposite of that. Right? Whereas The Last Jedi was risky, controversial, and surprising, this film is incredibly safe, very non-controversial, and very predictable. Um, it was a fun ride, but I was never like, holy crap! Except for the one moment with a character appearance that was spoiled for me that I'll talk about in the spoiler-filled episode next. So, uh, in that sense, uh, predictable. Did it hit the marks that you would expect from a Han Solo origin film? Pretty much, and the one that it didn't really hit, it really couldn't hit if there's going to be more solo films later, as Alden Ehrenreich seems to have suggested. So, the ones that they would have hit in this film, yeah, they pretty much hit all the ones that you would expect. I would say, before we move into characters and performances, which is the other big thing I wanted to deal with here uh, in the spoiler-free part, I would say that music-wise... Very unremarkable. Now, I've gone to see Star Wars films and not thought the music was particularly remarkable and then saw the film again or listened to the soundtrack and then it grew on me. I'm assuming that's probably what's going to happen this time, but it really felt like only Enfys Nest and the Cloud Rider Marauders had a theme that actually was clearly recognizable. Beckett has a very slight recognizable theme, and Han, I guess, has a slight recognizable theme, but the music felt very meh to me. Uh, and even what we got for the Cloud Riders was very different, but not great. So there was really nothing that made the music really stand out for me for this movie. All right, so as for performances, uh, the big stuff that I was worried about going into this was, you know, how do you recast major characters? Um, remember, this is a film that I was not all that interested in when they first announced it. I was one of the many who were like, we don't need this film. Uh, I didn't ask for this film. Why do we need to have this film? Yeah, I was not very excited. Honestly, I wasn't even excited up until probably about half an hour before we actually saw the film. I was still kind of like, meh. But the trailer sort of turned me around on having a more positive expectation, even if my expectations were still fairly low. Uh, but my biggest concern 
was basically uh, Alden Ehrenreich as Han and Donald Glover as Lando. Would they be able to really recapture these characters? And I made the example back when we were talking about the trailer about how, to me, you can sort of look at character recasting in three different tiers or three different types, all of which are present in the reboot Star Trek films. One way you can do it is simply cast somebody and they just make the character their own and they don't try to really emulate the other actor best known for that classic character. That would be like uh, Chris Pine playing Kirk. He's not playing Shatner playing Kirk. He's just Chris Pine playing Kirk and you're supposed to believe in his version of, a, of the character and in Shatner's version without necessarily being able to see the one lead into the other as one being a younger version of the other. You also have the other extreme, which is the really heavy emulation where you're like, oh my god, this actor could be a younger version of the original actor. That's what we got with Zachary Quinto with Spock in the reboot films. But then you have a middle ground, which is kind of what I was hoping to see here, because I didn't expect a Spock-level, Zachary Quinto-level emulation. Something where it was a blending of the two, where you cast somebody that when you look at them, you're like, I don't really see it. But then because of their mannerisms, their performance, um, their voice inflection, you're like, whoa, that really does fit well. I can believe this actor as this character, even if they don't exactly look the part. Uh, as in the case of Carl Urban, uh, replacing DeForest Kelly as a young Dr. McCoy, or a young Bones in the Trek films. So I was hoping for like a Urban or a Quinto version. What we got in a lot of ways, I think, was more of a Chris Pine version. Um, Alden Ehrenreich as Han it didn't take very long for me to buy him as a young Han Solo, or at least a young Han Solo type character. But did I ever buy him as a young Han Solo who would then evolve into the younger version of Harrison Ford that we see in A New Hope? No, never. Not at any point within the entire film. Um, in a lot of ways, Alden Ehrenreich is to Han Solo as Sean Patrick Flannery was to Indiana Jones. Because when I watch the Indiana Jones Chronicles, the young Indiana Jones Chronicles with Sean Patrick Flannery, I can buy him as Indy at that time in his life. There is no point ever in that entire series that I ever bought Sean Patrick Flannery as a young Harrison Ford Indiana Jones. Never. I bought River Phoenix more uh, as a young Harrison Ford Indiana Jones when we saw him in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade than I ever did with Sean Patrick Flannery. And that's kind of what we see here. Um, I can buy... Ehrenreich as a younger version of Han, but if you're telling me that he's going to transition directly into, you know, young Harrison Ford Han Solo, I have a real hard time visualizing and seeing that, because the voices aren't quite the same, uh, the mannerisms in some cases are similar, but it's more that Ehrenreich sort of took the character and made it his own for this era of his life, rather than trying to give us a performance that would seamlessly lead into, um, Harrison Ford. This is not Ewan McGregor and Alec Guinness by any means whatsoever. And I would say the same thing for Donald Glover and Lando. I know everybody's gushing about, oh my god, Donald Glover was amazing as Lando. He makes the film. He's so incredible. And the people saying this, I'm assuming, watched a different movie than I did. Because, I mean, he was serviceable as Lando. He did a good job as Lando in that moment. But never once did I look at him, even if I'm buying him as a young Lando, as this is the guy that's going to grow up a bit to be Billy D. Williams Lando. He... He did not have the swagger and the smoothness that Billy D. Williams did. He tried, but to me, it always came off as fake. And maybe that's the thing of Lando in that time of his life. He really is kind of faking the swagger until he actually gets the real kind of swagger, you know? Um, but for whatever reason, for me, that transition between performances is still pretty rough. Um, again, does it make or break the film? Not really. Um, you can buy them in that time of their life. But if you were to watch this and then immediately watch the original trilogy, I think it's going to feel kind of jarring seeing that transition between Ehrenreich and Glover and Ford and Williams. These are classic performances that really kind of captured a nuance meant to the character, or maybe gave the character nuance from the original trilogy. And here are guys trying a more Chris Pine or at best Carl Urban approach to the characters. I'd say Glover is leaning a little more towards the... Uh, the urban than the pine approach, whereas Aaron Reich was straight up the the pine approach. Neither of them going for the Quinto approach um, to give us this care this pair of characters. Um, so good performances. I mean, I like their performances. 
I don't think any of them were blowing the doors off the place. It was not anything amazing. They worked as the young versions, and that's pretty much about it. Um, as for uh, standout performance, I would say Beckett. I thought Woody Harrelson was great as Beckett, although we really kind of felt like Woody Harrelson as Woody Harrelson without the crazy that he had for a little while there. Vision, Paul Bettany as uh, Dryden Voss made a decently, uh, a decently menacing villain while at the same time seeing a little wishy-washy. Like, he's not super menacing, he's just kind of more smarmy and opportunistic, which I guess is a lot of the characters in this film. Uh, opportunism is everywhere. Uh, the new uh, Jonas, I forget his full name, uh, the guy that plays uh, Chewbacca now really gave a physicality to that character. And Aaron Wright did for Han also, a physicality to the characters that really wasn't there as much even in the original trilogy. Um, as for Kira, uh, Amelia Clark, pretty much what I said when we were talking about the trailers, right? I mean, I've never seen her really give a performance that blew me away. Um, she is great as Daenerys Targaryen, because the Daenerys Targaryen character has a lot of cool things to do, and a lot of cool visuals and sequences to put her into. But has her performance as Daenerys ever blown the roof off the place? Not in my opinion. Um, and it's sort of the same thing here. Um, take her and capture only her face giving the performance, none of the, the scenery or costuming that tell you what saga she's in, and have her deliver some lines from her performance in Game of Thrones, uh, from uh, uh, Terminator Genesis, and from this. And I'm telling you, you're going to be like, oh, I guess it's Amelia Clark being Amelia Clark. Right? I mean, she wasn't bad. Wasn't great. Kind of just there. Uh, the character fulfilled the role the character had to fulfill, and that's basically about it. So, it's a film that, uh, it's not going to be, I don't think we're going to be seeing, you know, any award nods, as if you would for sci-fi anyway, but any award nods for the individual um, uh, actors in it. Um, it was a fun film, an enjoyable film, and one that I would recommend you go see, even if you didn't like and really, if you didn't like any of the more recent Disney films, I think you're still going to wind up liking this particular Star Wars film. And I do find it interesting that I wonder what effect this is going to have on the uh, the controversy out there, the political controversy out there. Because you got a lot of people talking about how they don't like the politics of new Star Wars. And most of the time that comes back to diversity and representation in Star Wars films, and Disney having kind of an active plan slash agenda slash goal, however you want to characterize it, whatever negative or positive connotation you want to put into it, of trying to have more diverse casts. And yet, this wound up being a Star Wars film where of the four leads, who I would say are Han, Lando, Beckett, and Kira, uh, of the four leads, all but one are white, all but one are male, and it really was not a particularly diverse cast in this film at all. Uh, yes, those who go on the, the SJW tirade stuff will probably point out that the bad guy of the film, the big bad, is another white guy. But, I mean, that's kind of Star Wars. That's kind of been the way that it's tended to be most of the time. Um, so that's just kind of in keeping with what we've seen before, for better or worse. But I wonder if... I wonder how this will fit into that narrative. Like, those who are arguing over the diversity issue in Star Wars and the, the SJW this and Agenda this and all this kind of stuff, will this film quell some of that? Will it be seen as, oh, well, you're just pandering to the other side this time to quiet them? Or will it be sort of a, well, this film isn't new characters entirely so... Although, you know, neither are the sequel trilogy films. It's not new characters entirely. Um... But that somehow this will be set aside as because it doesn't fit that narrative of pushing heavy um, representation and diversity in a film, that this will be pushed aside out of that debate, and the debate and the argumentation, the flame wars and stuff will still continue, and this won't quell any of it. Hard to say, but it's the internet, so people will probably still be jerks back and forth um, one way or the other, whether they recognize the film or not. But interesting that it's not a film that really fits the style of... Uh, diversity that we see with more recent films, um, which has been a point of contention within the fan community, again, for better or worse. So, fun film, uh, not very controversial, very predictable, good performances, but not blowing the roof off the place. It's going to be a Star Wars film that I think that most Star Wars fans will be able to enjoy, whether you like the new canon or not. Beyond that, anything I'm going to say pretty much has to be within spoiler-filled territory. So we're going to cut this one here, 
Thank you for watching. May the Force be with you, of course. And if you want to continue into spoiler-filled territory, be sure to check out the next episode of the vlog. And hopefully by then, the lighting issue will be dealt with. I think the clouds and the sun constantly shifting outside is causing the same issue that my uh, bad lamp issues were in some previous videos. I just can't flip and win in that regard. Um, but hopefully I'll catch you in the next episode. Next episode, again, is spoiler-filled for Solo, a Star Wars story based on notes I was able to take uh, on second viewing. So lots of stuff to talk about, and I hope to catch you then.